Welcome to the Second Bite Podcast, where we talk with top entrepreneurs and CEOs about creating valuable companies through creative transactions. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome back to the Second Bite Podcast. I have an excellent guest with me today, Brian Schmidt from Court Square. Brian, super happy to have you with us. Likewise. Thanks for having me on, Todd. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is going to be a great conversation, Brian. Um, people may that listen to the podcast may know the name of Court Square because of the transaction that you did with Power Digital and with right. Grace and the Friends. And if 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 you're listening and you want to go back, it's a great interview to listen to. And so I want to dig into that a little bit, and I want to understand. I know Grayson talked about on his podcast the fact that. Court Square is a great partner. They were not the highest bidder. They weren't the most of this. They weren't the most of that. But yet they pick you for a reason. I'd really like to understand that. And then I'd also like to dig into your Court Square and the track record that Court Square has in terms of taking pretty good sized companies and making them even more valuable. You have a long track record of accomplishing that. I'd like to understand for all of our listeners a little bit more about how that happens on such a consistent basis at Court Square. So from that standpoint, first, let me thank our, our sponsors are the people at eCohen. eCohen is a, a, a really good accounting firm here in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, they have helped me and worked with a lot of my clients in, in terms of preparing them with a financial workbook that's gap compliant, that's accrued properly and on and on. So eCohen is eCohen.com. They're a great firm. If you want to check them out, you can do that. Um, so thanks to them. So Brian, let's jump in. First, if, if you can, take me for a minute or two on your background, how you got to Court Square, and then m- maybe a little bit of an intro into Court Square themselves. Absolutely. Uh, again, Todd, thanks for having me. Excited to be on. Um, listen to a couple of these podcasts now, and I think they're, they're really great for for all the marketers out there. My name is Brian Schmidt. I am a vice president at Court Square, which is a, a middle market private equity fund that's based in New York City. We have about 40 investment professionals and a, uh, you know, give or take a $3 billion fund that we invest out of that was raised a couple of years ago. Um, so the, the background behind Court Square specifically is it's always been a founder friendly investment firm. Um, Back prior to, prior to 2004, it was actually inside Citibank um, and was known as, a, known as Citibank Venture Capital. Uh, it spun out in 2004. We've been uh, industry vertical specific investors since. Um, we have four industry verticals. All of them are you know, staffed with highly thematic, specialized individuals such as myself that focus on specific subsectors. Um, we're currently on our fourth fund since spinning out of Citibank in 2004. We're going to be raising our fifth uh, in the near term here. Again, all those funds have been give or take three billion in size. Uh, I think you know one notable stat about Court Square that that is rather impressive is um, of the 11 billion plus dollars that we've invested, um, we've returned 30 plus billion dollars to. Um, to our investors from those invest in, investments. So really strong, profitable track record over a, you know, call it a, a 40 plus year period, um, you know, long before I joined, call it five plus years ago. Um, what one area that differentiates us uh, as a $3 billion fund, so call it a larger private equity fund, is the fact that we, we have a disproportionate amount of our partnerships or investments with founder owners. Um, so 70% plus of the deals that we've done over the past two funds, give or take 10 years, have been with founder owners. Um, and you'll see that a lot at the you know, sub a billion dollar fund level. Uh, that's a lot more common, but it's, it's very rare at the, the fund size of $3 billion plus. Um, and there's been you know, multiple studies out there that proves what kind of alpha, alpha that can generate for a, a, fund, a fund like ours. Yeah, so Todd, I, I know you asked about you know, how we differentiated ourselves and ultimately you know, convinced Grayson and the power team to partner with us. And, you know, I think there's, there's several, there's some good background to that answer. And, you know, first and foremost, we developed a thesis uh, in the performance marketing agency space years ago. 
uh, and, and have since evaluated, you know, 10, 20 plus businesses in, in the category. Um, but stepping back as to why, the, why we developed the thesis, um, we understand performance marketing more broadly incredibly well um, and the broader advertising and marketing ecosystem um, from, you know, end advertiser to end customer, end eyeball, so to speak. And, and that's really by virtue of some of our own portfolio investments in partnerships with founder owners. So we have investments that consume performance marketing services. Um, we have investments that are specialized or vertically focused agencies in their own right, not just Power Digital now, but businesses like Medical Knowledge Group that focus on the healthcare space. Um, we also have an intimate understanding of the infrastructure or the advertising technology uh, intermediaries that actually help effectuate digital advertising, right? Think about it as the pipes um, that effectuate digital advertising, similar to the pipes in a financial services company. Um, we have an investment in Kinetics in that space, which is a really interesting business. Um, and then we have a really good understanding, finally, about where performance marketing dollars are spent. Uh, we own a variety of digital publishers called Health Union and System One that have really unique web properties that create sort of nice targeted advertising opportunities. Um, and then, you know, finally, I think that we have, you know, investments in both marketing and business decision making oriented players, such as Dynata, which is a market research firm, and Data Axle. And so all this is to say we have an intimate understanding of the space, and we were able to take that and you know, demonstrate that to Grayson very quickly. Um, we were really looking for the right founder uh, and the right business within the performance marketing agency space, and we were introduced to Grayson well ahead of you know, his decided sale process, built a relationship with him, his team, uh, and we're ultimately able to be, you know, call it the chosen party in what was a competitive process um, where price um, was, you know, not the, the foremost consideration. Um, there were both. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, was say, I think it's really interesting that because a, a lot of times I think guys feel like I shouldn't be talking to private equity until I'm ready to do something. And, <laughs> What would your advice on that be? You know, I think I think educating yourself about any of your potential partner, future partners, or opportunities well ahead of a process, especially if you're a, a founder, is a great idea. Um, there's a lot of different flavors, not just to private equity, but to a strategic sale, to an IPO, whatever it may be, right? Even to a, a joint venture or partnership. And so, the longer you can understand who your future part, you know, you can spend time with folks understand who your partners are going to be, who they are, it's important. And, you know, we offer to Grayson, as we do to most of our founders, the opportunity to go and speak with both our current, you know, founding partners and operators and, and former. And, and not just deals that went well. You know, there's been a disproportionate amount of deals that went well for Court Square over the years, um, a lower percentage that went poorly. But the reality is we want them to speak to the, the folks that, you know, had good and bad experiences, right? Sure. In terms of outcome. Because what were we like to partner with, with when, when, when times were tough, when things were challenging, right? I think that truly differentiates you as a partner. And it was a very, very valuable tool for Grayson. Um, in addition to, you know, the experience that we brought to bear, the industry understanding, yeah. um, and, you know, ultimately the ability um, or, or dedicated focus on founder-owned and operated businesses. Just a quick jump in there. So I know you're from the transaction with Grayson that he uh, described to us. In that transaction with Grayson, he was the founder, but he was also owned by private equity at the time. So obviously, I assume you still consider him a founder. Do you also prefer that, that quote unquote, professionalism of, a, of another private equity group that maybe has aligned it appropriately to make the acquisition easier? You know, I'd say we're agnostic. Um, sometimes you prefer one, sometimes you prefer the other. It's all situational dependent. I'd say what was great about Grayson um, and his partnership with Periscope is there was a lot of things that Periscope probably helped institute uh, along the way that made the business more valuable, um, particularly the, the muscle memory and function around the ability to execute on M&A and scale a sales and marketing organization. 
um, taking Grayson's business, which, you know, I think at the time of Periscope's investment was, um, you know, sub, sub 10 million of EBITDA, pretty focused on earned media, right? And then vastly expanding that both organically and through m a um, to be a pretty even mix of both paid and earned media, um, but also figuring how to acquire the right businesses, acquire businesses that had complementary service lines that you could then cross-sell and upsell both powers, existing client base and that acquired client. Yeah, and they did that really well. And they did it really well. And so, you know, sometimes you buy businesses that have prior, um, you know, institutional investments like Power Digital, and that's great for certain things, um, as I just described. Sometimes you meet a business uh, that's completely bootstrapped, right? Uh, And we have plenty of those investments in our portfolio as well that have built that infrastructure out themselves. It's really just a matter of, what specific business? What, what's the right business? What's the right founder to partner with? Is it, is it fair to think in my mind that, that you guys kind of have a, a, a checklist, if you will, that says, obviously, we need a good product offering, great customers, but we need to see these other things. And is capability to integrate M&A and a, a, a robust sales team, are those two key offerings? And are there others you would add to that? Yeah, those are those are critical. I think that the cornerstones are what we look for when we invest in businesses is first and foremost, you know, looking for that right partner, um, and oftentimes that's a founder, uh, and then looking for profitable growth. Right, you kind of start there, and then you you can go into some of those specific categories as you mentioned, um, strong sales and demand function, right, um, ability to integrate M and A. All those things are incredibly important, and we look for. I think. You know, it's it's rare to find a business like Power that is as robust of a team, robust of an of, of infrastructure, right? Um, having evaluated probably 20 plus performance marketing agencies over the past four years, I can tell you that Power's, uh, you know, one of a handful, um, if not the most unique that we've evaluated. And so, you know, when you find something like that and there's a partnership dynamic between you and Grayson and the broader team that really clicks. Um, you know, it's, it's something that you have to chase after. And what did you notice about what they're, obviously their, their revenue growth and EBITDA growth was great, but there was, especially having evaluated so many, what about them was so attractive? Yeah, look, again, it, going back to the, the founder owner operator partnerships that we have, right. And then focusing on profitable growth. After that, you jump into a couple different things. You know, Grayson and the team are very entrepreneurial, right? Um, They also rolled meaningful equity into the transaction. Um, And that is very indicative of what they believed uh, the future prospect of the prospect of the business held. Uh, And that that creates what I'm to ask, and you know, don't tell me about Grayson, but when you see a significant roll forward as a percentage, what is that of the deal? You know, I can't specify on um, the specific percentage, but it's it's meaningful, both in the way of percentage and dollars. And what I'll tell you is it wasn't just Grayson, the founder CEO. It went down, you know, multiple layers within the management team and every single manager rolled that same percentage. Really? And that's incredibly valuable. Uh, and, and, you know, we have not seen this deep of a role um, and participation in many of our other deals. And so that just tells you that everyone's very much aligned um, for the future and believes in in what power can continue to uh, you know power can continue to perform and become you know an even better business than it than it is today. So at so a three billion dollar fund for what we're used to talking to people on this uh, podcast is significant. Where do you guys have a cutoff in terms of the the minimum EBITDA number and what's kind of the sweet spot that you're most comfortable with? Yeah. And and so I'll take that in two parts. I think the first part is our platform investments, which we typically have 15 to 20 platform investments across a $3 billion fund. And so, you know, we'll write an equity check as low as 75 million um, up to five, 600 million. Um, The sweet spot really for us is, you know, call it that 150 to (laughs) 250 type of equity check range. Um, and that kind of gets you to you know, 12 to 20, 20 uh, platform deals in the fund. 
Now, we also hold back a portion of that $3 billion, Todd, for M&A um, to perform add-ons for those platform companies. And so, you know, we put a certain amount of upfront capital into power, but we're certainly looking to be acquisitive for Power Digital. And some of that, you know, some of those acquisitions down the line may be partially funded with debt, but also also funded with new equity um, that we would put into the business to, you know, help bolster a service, you know, bolster or accelerate a service offering, for example. Right. Um, so, that's, so that's a bit of that's a bit of background. So if I were to back into it a little bit, you're going to put debt on t- in addition to your equity, right? So is correct. Roughly, so let's just say you write a check for a hundred million dollars of equity. There's another hundred and fifty million of debt, or hundred million of debt. Yeah, maybe, maybe to use round numbers, you know, hypothetically, you have a hundred million dollar deal. You'd fund forty, fifty million of that with debt, uh, and the remainder with equity. You know, in today's environments where valuation multiples are seemingly stretched, um, and by the way, we're recording this in in July of 2022, so. Yeah. Don't quote me if valuation multiples continue to compress as they have over the past few months. But I'd say valuation multiples in, in for platforms in the performance marketing space are are typically much higher, you know, mid to high teens in some cases, right? And so maybe you're funding uh, a 15 times deal, for example, right? Maybe you're funding five five times of that with debt and 10 times of that with equity. So meaningful equity cushion. And these are all profitable businesses. Uh, we're profitable growth oriented investors. And so they actually have the capacity to take on debt, unlike you know many of these startup-oriented businesses or venture capital-backed yeah. businesses that are generating revenue but are not yet profitable. And so we're always very prudent in how we use debt as a you know a essentially a, a lever to accelerate or supercharge your returns. But we're going to do it prudently, and we're never looking to overlever businesses, and especially in today's environment where multiples are where they are. That is, um, you know, less meaningful than maybe it used to be in the heyday of private equity in the in the eighties and nineties. Right. So then, when you do a, a transaction, for example, you're it probably I will interpret that to be somewhere around twenty ish plus million of EBITDA. Let you write right. the equity check you want, get the leverage you want from, debt, right, and then leave room for people to roll in, right, from that standpoint. Exactly. Exactly. However, when you start to think about tuck-ins, right, to add capability set, certainly doesn't need to be 20 or 25 million bucks. Could be, I would imagine, much lower. Depend If there was a unique capability set, maybe it's as low as two or three. And if it's bolting on more capability that you already have, maybe it's five or six. Is that is that about right? Yeah, that's right. Look, I think you know we'll definitely stretch as low as two or three, and I think just given the scale of Power Digital, which you know this is this has been made known by Grace, and we're call it thirty million plus of EBITDA today, and so the deals we're looking to do from an M and A perspective um, are going to be bigger going forward, just because we've grown as a company, uh, and so yeah, we'll stretch the two or th- we'll stretch down to two or three, especially if there's a great service line that can accelerate some of our organic efforts. Um, but you know we're realistically looking for deals uh, a little bit bigger nowadays, just given how we've grown. Yeah. So, give me um, some insight for the guys that will or women that'll be listening to this, who are two or three million of EBITDA, and 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 for whatever reason they don't tuck into to Power Digital or or Court Square. If there was one or two areas for them to focus on. To add, because if you're at two or three million, you've built a successful business. Now, if you want to take it to the next level, what what should they be focused on to help them to get there? And is it easier to do it with a, a smaller private equity part? Yeah, I think there's a, a real delineation in the space between platforms and you know businesses that end up selling. Um, it's really hard to scale your business beyond five-ish million of EBITDA. And we've seen that time and time again in this space. Um, And and a large reason behind that is it's a people-driven business, right? And if you lose your people, yeah, there's tech-enabled natures to a lot of this business. But if you lose your people, you're going to have a hard time growing, right? And sometimes you have a specific service line offering that you're really good at. Maybe it's email. Maybe it's paid search, right? But expanding into a different category becomes really hard to do organically. 
Uh, and so sometimes private equity is a really good solution um, for helping you take your business to the next level. But oftentimes you really need to have a strong founder and manager that is capable of taking the business to the next level. And I think that's where you've sometimes seen um, an incongruency between A, having the capital, having the right founder and manager, um, and then having the ability to adequately hire, right? You know, everyone says the first couple hires are incredibly important and will determine not just the culture, but the fate likely of your organization. And then those hires are going to go hire folks below them. Um, and so trying to maintain a high quality, high standard um, and successful hiring becomes really difficult, especially as you scale, you know, to, to four or five million plus of EBITDA. And a private equity partner, I think, can be really helpful. I think the currency of private equity is really valuable in the agency and consultancy space, um, especially if you look at how broken the public hold call, hold call model is, both from an operating perspective and from a compensation perspective. Um, getting folks to roll equity in alignment uh, in a transaction, both employees and the private equity investors, all being in kind of the same equity security, all being in it together for the long term creates a really valuable dynamic and allows you to have longer term thinking than, hey, I'm working at, you know, agency hold code one, two, or three, and I'm really focused on my cash bonus this year. Um, you'll have a cash bonus too, right? But the bigger nugget or the, you know, the, the, the pot at the end of the rainbow, so to speak, right, is a three to five year exit where you're focused on strategically growing your business. Uh, and you'll have a private equity partner that can help you do that. And I think that that's a really valuable thing in, you know, a human services oriented industry. What do you, with a, a business that's four or five, six million of EBITDA, what would we'll call them mistakes do you see most commonly occur? I, I, a couple things. You know, one thing we see time and time again is lack of focus on your core customer group. Um, and so, Looking th at things like client retention, you can tell right away that, you know, maybe these folks product offering isn't quite as dialed in as it needs to be. And so I think our biggest piece of advice to a lot of these single or dual service offer offering businesses that are sub, sub five of EBITDA is focus on your core customer set, focus on your one or two core service lines, get really good at those service lines, execute well, hire people that can execute well, and that'll, that'll equate to better retention. And then start focusing on, okay, I'm going to start building out a sales and marketing function. I'm going to build out a finance function. I'm going to build out my IT or technology stack, right? I think focusing on the basics and providing value for your clients, it sometimes gets lost in the sauce of, I have a million, $2 million EBITDA business and I want to scale quickly. Um, being patient is incredibly important especially at that stage of your business. And it's oftentimes overlooked, especially in the environment we've been in over the past 10 years where, you know, speed or speed to market and scaling as quickly as possible at the expense of profitability has been the name of the game. And I think there's a reversal of that that's happening in the market today that'll actually be really benefit beneficial for, you know, these types of founders. So you said there was a couple of things and that was one. Is there another one that jumps to mind? Um, I, you know, I would say being focused on hiring well, as I previously mentioned, uh, the importance there, right? And then it not, again, not investing your dollars ahead of generating profitable revenue necessarily, because if you have a, a re if you're generating revenue, but no profitability, is that a really proven long-term business model? Yeah. I think some folks would question that, right? And so that's been a trend over the past 10 plus years as capital's been cheap. And there's been a lot of folks that have done that only to, you know, realize five, 10 years later that, hey, I've scaled my revenue, but I'm still not a profitable business, which probably means in the long term, you may not be a going concern. Um, unless your goal is to maybe get acquired by a large strategic that wants you for a specific purpose. But that's becoming harder to do given compressed, you know, private and public market valuations at present where folks aren't as aggressive as maybe they used to be in trying to acquire these unprofitable businesses. And so you guys have been successful, obviously, at continuing to raise funds, large funds. And the reason for that is you obviously have a system to take a valuable business and make it more valuable. So after you acquire a business, you bring on a portfolio company. 
do you have a set game plan at Court Square that says this is how we take you and triple the size or quadruple the size? And maybe just give us a little insight into what that's like. Yeah. Yeah. Look, there's there's a lot of firms that have set playbooks. Right. Um, and that works really well if you are a vertical software, you know, enterprise software, SaaS based specialist investor. Right. And every company you're looking at has a lot of the similar characteristics. Like I said before, we have four dedicated vertical specialty areas within services, healthcare, technology, and industrials. All of those businesses and the business models and the revenue models, right, are all very different. And so we have unique playbooks kind of at an industry level, so to speak. Um, but there's not a unique playbook that is across our entire firm. Um, a lot of the attributes of the playbook are similar, but the implementation maybe is a little bit different. Um, and so we bring, a, we bring a number of resources to bear off the bat. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think is, and, and we should talk about this further, is just the vertical expertise, right? So I am very, my group uh, within services is incredibly focused on marketing services, info services, uh, advertising technology, digital commerce. Those are some core categories that we focus exclusively on and know well. And so you know, we have intimate understanding of, of the ins and outs of that industry and the business models and how they work that we can bring to bear day one. We also have operating resources that, that we can bring to bear at, you know, the founder or manager's election. Um, by no Give means me an is it a requirement. Yeah, so we have, we have an IT uh, resource partner that can help with all things IT, whether that be, you know, getting a new tech stack, whether that be implementing cybersecurity, Helping with cyber insurance, you know, a number of a number of things that fall under, you know, called the traditional IT purview. Um, Jessica Pizzo is a, a a great resource partner from that perspective, and is, you know, working hand in hand with a number of companies and CPOs in particular to help effectuate some of those positive changes that are incredibly important, especially in the marketing vertical. Right? We have a finance resource partner and HR resource partner that can help you you know, think about scaling those particular organizations or addressing any issues that may arise. Uh, we also have a sales resource partner leader that, that can help with scaling a sales and demand function or, or, or organizations. And so those are all really nice resources to bring to bear that can help these businesses that maybe haven't had, um, you know, a professional view on, on any of those organizations within their business yet. You know, I'm also at the when Grayson, for example, it was Power, uh, Periscope Equity in Chicago, he partnered with originally. And I think for a lot of guys, when they acquire a business that's five or six of EBITDA, and if they're going to take it to 20 or 25, you have a $25 million EBITDA business, there's tons of private equity groups that would be interested in acquiring that. If you then buy a 25, let's make it easy math for me, a $30 million EBITDA business, and you multiply that by five, now you're at 150 million of EBITDA. Do you guys think about right. upfront how are we going to get out of this thing and who's the buyer going to be, or do you just focus on if we build a business that's profitable, we'll have it for as long as we'll have it? Yeah, look, it's certainly a consideration, right? Um, and and we we think about that with our our own investment committee process for every asset that we invest in. What I'll say, generally speaking, though, is if you feel like you have a solid business that's going to continue to grow at, you know, above, you know, industry leading levels, right? Uh, which power is certainly doing, by the way. Um, and, and you feel confident in that team's ability to continue to do that. And you feel like there's some nice M&A opportunities as well. Um, you know, you feel pretty good about where you're going to be. Um, the, the universe of potential buyers does get smaller as you get bigger. It's just a lot of large numbers, right? And there are less, you know, twenty billion dollar private equity firms than there are three billion dollar private equity firms than there are, you know, billion dollar private equity firms like Periscope, for example. Um, and so you do need to think about that. But there's also other avenues, right? There's an I, there's an IPO avenue, um, which I think is a real possibility if you look at some of both the digital transformation assets and the, you know, call it more performance marketing oriented tech forward players like an S4 that have gone public and trade at pretty nice multiples, or at least did until, um, until the recent market downturn. And so I think there'll be more proof points, especially in the public markets, over the next three to five years 
of dedicated, you know, performance oriented tech forward agencies in the marketplace that will be, you know, highly traded, high multiple businesses. And so you'll have a variety of paths, but yes, your, your addressable universe does shrink, but we're really focused on continuing to grow like we have, expanding our service line offering and doing, you know, valuable accretive M&A that makes sense for the business. And I think if we do all those things right, um, we'll have no problem. You know, we'll, we'll be faced with a number of good outcomes, um, you know, a couple of years down the line. Give uh, us just a little bit of an insight into what investment committee is and is really like, uh, you know, when, how that manages itself through a, a private equity group in general or in specific at, at Core Square. Yeah, investment and, and look, it really does vary by type of firm, whether you're venture capital, growth equity, private equity. Um, you know, I think what is really unique about Core Square's investment committee is the entire investment committee has in, been investing with each other for 30 ish years. Um, so they've seen everything, right? They've seen businesses through different cycles. They know, and they're all experts in dedicated areas, uh, whether that be healthcare, industrial technology, et cetera. Um, and so it's a really smart group of individuals that is able to identify, you know, the key, key thematic um, theses and potential risks of businesses very quickly. Um, but the way the process actually works is, you know, you'll, you'll update them essentially along the way of, you know, a sale or negotiated deal process that you're looking to do. And so as we perform our diligence, the deal team on specific areas of a business, we will relay those findings to the committee and, and we, we meet on Mondays um, and we'll spend, you know, an hour, hour plus sometimes talking about specific aspects of the business to ensure that the committee is, you know, kept apprised of all the different updates as we move along in the deal process. Um, and, you know, they're on board with the investment essentially. Got it. Um, a couple of specific things to the degree that you can. I know that, you know, we had the opportunity to talk in, in detail around some of your, you know, how you, you structure acquisitions. And we spoke a lot about these incentive units that you guys use and create that for me, I've, I've gone to battle for a lot of clients to try to get significant upside incentives post-close. And it was a hard fight. You guys have this as, as right. kind of a, um, <laughs> a, just a course to do in business, which was, which was great to hear and to deal with. Can you talk about, first of all, your, just your thought process around the incentive piece maybe how much you carve out for a typical company, and then the difference between incentive units and stock options and the others and why you chose them. Yeah, it, and maybe not to insert a commercial here, Todd, but this goes back to, I should first back up and talk about why we do this. And we do this for both our platform investments and for potential add-ons. Um, especially when you're investing, again, in, in the human capital services mm -hmm. business, um, we feel like equity is equity for employees and managers is key to success in growing a business. It's key to growing revenue, growing profitability, client retention, employee retention, satisfaction, et cetera. Um, and so we've implemented this across our portfolio. And, and this is something we've done um, for 40 plus years. And it's really one of the keys to private equity, right? And, and private equity success versus a public markets company over the, over the long term and why private equity as an asset class returns a higher, uh, a higher IRR than, public, than the public markets in general. Um, and so we've also done it at a you know, add-on level for portfolio companies. And so Power is a great example of doing this. Um, we're working on a deal right now uh, that we're looking to you know, close hopefully in the next 60 plus days where we're inviting that business who's selling those founders to roll into power digital equity at the same exact, in the same exact security as the rest of the power team in Court Square. Uh, because again, in terms of alignment and partnership, we view those individuals just as key to our success, right? Um, as the individuals that we originally partnered with at power. Uh, and so why should they be treated any differently? Um, 
you know, I think three other things really quick is just, this is what power's more or less done historically as well, right? Um, and, and, and the founders that power's done for historical m and deals with over the past three, three years, they've all rolled significant equity proceeds into the power digital business. They've actually oftentimes made more money on what they rolled than the, the, the amount they were able to cash out at the close of the sale of their business, which, which is a testament to how this model works and, and the, the trajectory of power. Right, it aligns the incentives between them and power going forward, which is really what you're paying for as a buyer. As a buyer, um, if you want these folks to continue to perform, right, and add value to the business that that you own, um, and it's also pretty incredible the retention rates that not just the top managers, but the rank and file employees below those top managers uh, have have achieved. And so, power's acquired again four businesses, and retention rates have been in the high 90s. Um, for the core business and all the acquired businesses. And, and a lot of that, I think, is due to equity um, and the culture that power has and the upward career you know, mobility and, pers- and perspective that it provides. Um, so, you know, all around, it's, it's, it, and it's a great outcome. And you're typically adding a service offering that is additive to the core power offering, which is a better outcome for clients, right? Because, you know, now you can do... XYZ offering versus before maybe you were just focused on SEO, right? And so it creates a really nice positive client experience um, for all the clients. And so, so that's, just... that's, that's the strategy. Um, and, and I think it's important to kind of frame that before I answered, you know, how we, how we actually structure some of these And let me push back on about. just, yeah, on one thing there, because you talk about alignment. And, and every private equity group talks about alignment. But you can create yeah. alignment. You're giving l- the identical security that you guys have and, and that your platform company has, right? You're giving the identical. I, my pushback would be, I don't think you have to do that. You could, do, you could give them, you could give an a acquisition, <clears throat> excuse me, 75 or 80%. And that would still be aligned. And yet you guys don't do that. It, it, in, in the conversation we had, it felt like you were giving more than you needed to. Would you agree with that or not? Look, I think, I think when we find businesses, we're, we are particular, specifically at Power at finding the right type of add-on. Um, we want an individual that's going to be in it for the long haul who's not just trying to sell and cash out proceeds. So sure, uh, Todd, we, we, we could, but I think the way you structure these deals is um, there's a reason that power has been successful doing this. There's a reason court square has been successful with this equity plan over, you know, a 30 plus year history. And so, you know, it's, it's proven out as success. And so why, why change something that's not broken? And, and yeah, other private equity firms have maybe a little bit of a different strategy, but we think this complete and utter alignment, um, creates the most value and allows you, you know, you all to sleep at night and be chasing after the same goal. And so you, that manifests itself in your incentive units. Can you describe that a little bit? Yes. So what I was just describing really was equity role, um, which would be, hey, we're going to do a deal with you. You're going to roll some of your proceeds from your prior ownership in your business into Power Digital, hypothetically. But in certain circumstances, we're also really interested in providing, you know, go forward performance incentive units, which are pretty similar to options, um, except that they are, um, they are tax efficient, right? Um, you can typically get capital gains tax treatment depending on your jurisdiction. Um, and why that's, you know, why that's powerful is that's incremental juice that you're going to get as a specific individual, uh, or employee to motivate you going forward. So not only are you going to roll equity and be tied in from that perspective and be motivated to generate value going forward, but we're going to give you a sweetener on top because we believe in you. We want you to lead X, Y, Z function at power. Right. Um, and you know, we're all, well, we are all aligned and in this together. And so we do that across all of our investments. Um, and it's essentially, you know, providing diluting court square, um, and the initial equity owners for the benefit of the employees. And you guys create a pool there. How, that pool is typically what percent of the overall company? You know, it really it really varies on the business, Todd. Um, but it's it's meaningful, uh, and it's and it's typically intended to go very deep. 
um, in the employee base. And so, you know, that's something that I think you're starting to see private equity firms do uh, to a larger to larger degree than they had historically. But that is that is effectively what's going on, and it's all contingent on future growth of the business, future value, right? Um, because again, these are structured to say you are going to be rewarded for your future endeavors, right? And the future growth that you help create for the business. Um, and you will be handsomely rewarded if that growth does occur, right? Yeah. And then you find people are are pulling a little bit harder. They're staying a little bit longer. They're a little bit more focused. And the upside reward, you guys have a, a, a long history of of making large distributions in your incentive units on transaction exit, I assume. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. And it's worked. It's worked incredibly well, as evidenced by you know some of the some of the returns that I mentioned that that Court Square has been lucky to achieve over you know the past thirty plus years. Yeah, my guess is it's not as much luck as it is um, you know, <laughs> the, the, the factors that you've gone through, which have been you know super helpful. Uh, it's just getting a little bit more insight into the kind of the multi layers that are in private equity. But if you can take a, a really good private equity group and understand some of these little mechanisms that are um, are so critical into your you know your long term success. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think in the, in the history behind that at Court Square, which is a little bit interesting, is being inside Citibank, we were known as Citibank Venture Capital. We were much more venture capital oriented, at least in terms of our deal uh, velocity, where we would sometimes do, and this is long before I um, before I joined, but we would sometimes do 50 deals in a year. Um, and, and so what does that mean? That means we really need to back managers that we believe in um, that can scale the business. Because again, I, I'm an investor. I'm not a manager, Todd. Um, I can help you grow your business strategically, but you know, I, I don't know how to operate a business. And, and frankly, I don't really want to operate a business, right? I want to support a great founder who can operate their business themselves. And so what you need to do is find a way to you know, add that extra incentive for that, that founder um, or operator to go above and beyond, right? And that's exactly what, you know, call it this equity incentive provides uh, that, that individual to do. Well, you know, it was interesting because when I did the interview, the episode with Grayson, and you see such a dynamic guy that's built such a successful business, and he talked about Court Square and here's why we picked him and we picked him over others for, for these reasons. I was just really curious as to why you would make that selection. And I think from from this 45 minutes together, that has become very apparent. So uh, it, was, it was great for you to share like you did, Brian. I appreciate that. It'll be great to watch the success of power as it happens over the next few years. So I will wish you well with that and with other investments. Yeah. And uh, I'll thank you very much for spending your time here. Brian Schmidt, people can find you if need be on LinkedIn. Also, your contact information will be in the show notes. So, you know, people can get this podcast wherever they listen to podcasts. But if you go to secondbitepodcast.com, you can find the show notes there and connections to, to Brian. And, and you can uh, find Grayson's interview and interviews with others as well. So, Brian, you were a tremendous uh, guest. Thanks so much for spending time with us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Likewise, look forward to being on again, Todd. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll speak soon. Sounds great. Thanks for listening to the Second Bite Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.